So now let's transition and talk a little bit more about ultrasound probes. Obviously there's numerous probes to select from and I'm going to give you a brief overview about which probes you should use. Now the differences between the different probes is the frequency. So there's some general rules to take with you. High frequency sound waves generally equate to good resolution but shallow tissue penetration. Low frequency sound waves generally equate to deep tissue penetration but less resolution. So let's talk about some of those low frequency probes. Again, these are going to be the probes that you can look a little deeper, but the resolution is usually a little bit worse. The probe on the top is commonly called the curvilinear probe. Some people call it the abdominal probe. Some people call it the C60 probe because it's 60 millimeters along the scan face here. And you can see here that it produces the sound waves in this fashion here and the footprint at the top of the screen will look something like this. This is a 3.5 to 5 megahertz probe. Again, this would be classified as a low frequency probe and it's most commonly used for the abdomen. The next thing you see below is the phased array probe and this is sometimes called the cardiac probe. It is also a low frequency probe. 1.5 to 5 megahertz. It's 28 millimeters across the scan face. That's the major strength of this probe. It has a small footprint, as you can see right here, which would allow you to look between the ribs at the heart or the lung or whatever it is exactly in the thorax you're trying to take a look at. There's this common misconception that you can't use this probe to ultrasound the abdomen. You certainly can, but it's most commonly used for imaging the thorax, again, for this small footprint that allows you to look between the ribs. Now one difference if you compare this probe to this probe is that the cardiac probe is a phased array probe. So the sound waves are originating really from one point and they're kind of steered off into space rather than coming out in a parallel fashion and originating from a wide surface area from the abdominal probe. Then there's the high frequency probe and there's numerous high frequency probes. The most common one is going to be your basic linear probe, L38. It's 38 millimeters across. And this one is a 5 to 10 megahertz probe. And you can see again, it's an array transducer where you have multiple channels producing these parallel sound waves. And this, is, again, because it's high frequency, is going to be more shallow in terms of penetration, but much higher resolution. So let's take a look at some examples. Here's our abdominal probe. We can tell it's abdominal probe because we're looking at the footprint here. And you can see it's a curved footprint with good deep penetration. You can see down here we're well over 15 centimeters of depth. Here's our cardiac probe. You can see that our sound waves are originating from one focal point and fanning out similar to our abdominal probe. But again, if you compare this footprint to this footprint, the origin of the sound is a small focal point. But again, you can see here or well over 15 centimeters of depth. Why? Because they're both low frequency probes. I'll just have a look over here. This is our linear probe. Look at the resolution on the screen. It's much nicer. You see some muscle tissues here. You can see a vessel here and here. And you can see your depth right here. It's approximately four centimeters deep. So you have this nice high resolution image, but very superficial in terms of depth. And we can see again the linear footprint. Now we're going to talk a little bit about probe orientation and for people who really have no ultrasound experience this is probably the most complicated portion of your basic ultrasound discussion is how to orient the probe. This will take a little bit of time if you're new to this but make sure you practice and once you get a little bit of practice this will become automatic kind of like driving a car or riding a bike. The most basic tenet of your probe orientation is going to be your probe marker. On the side of each probe, there will be some kind of probe marker that will correlate with either a dot or a proprietary emblem, in this case GE, on the screen. You have to look on that probe face. You have to look on the side of the probe to figure out where that probe indicator is. I'll tell you, most of the time, both sides of the probe have some kind of line or seam or dot there that will confuse you. So you have to pay extra close attention to see where the actual probe marker is. A little cheater's trick, particularly if you have the probe covered with a probe cover and you're not actually able to see the sides of the probe, you can just touch with your finger and some 
you can just touch with your finger the side of the probe and you'll see a little motion and if the side that you're touching elicits some movement on this side of the screen then you'll know that that is your probe indicator. So there is two so everybody has heard of the three basic planes when compared to human anatomy. You have the sagittal plane, you have the coronal plane, and the transverse plane. We're not going to belabor that here. I'll tell you, most of the time with regards to ultrasound, your probe orientation is going to be with the probe indicator pointing to the patient's right in a trans. In terms of probe in terms of orientation, you all have a basic understanding of sagittal, coronal, and transverse. The more common terminology that you're going to hear is short axis or long axis. That's usually synonymous with transverse and sagittal. And those words are often used interchangeably. Well, let's start basic. Here you have a probe that has been oriented in a transverse axis relative to the body. So you see this green plane here. The probe indicator is pointing to the patient's right. So this would be the corresponding image. Here's your GE right here, correlating with a probe indicator that's located on the opposite side of the probe that you can't see here. And then we have the spine right here. Here we have two vessels. Which one is the IVC and which one is the aorta? Well, because we have the probe indicator pointing to the patient's right, and that correlates with this GE right here, we know that the left-hand side of the screen correlates with the right-hand side of the patient. Because the probe indicator located on this side of the, of the probe is pointing to the patient's right. The right-hand side of the screen correlates with the left-hand side of the patient. This side does not have the probe indicator and is pointing to the left-hand side of the patient again represented by the right hand side of the screen. We know that the vessel on your left, the patient's right, because you imagine we're in a transverse plane, we're looking from the feet towards the head, so this would be the patient's right, your left, is going to be the IVC because we know that the IVC is positioned to the patient's right of the spine, whereas this vessel must be the aorta because we know that the aorta normally is positioned to the patient's left your right. Again, we're standing at the feet looking up towards the head in this transverse plane. The next orientation I want to talk to you about is the long axis orientation, also known as the sagittal plane. And what we've done now is rotated the probe indicator from the patient's right up towards the patient's head. So here's your probe indicator and we know that that is pointing towards the patient's head. So it stands to reason that the patient's head would be here, their feet would be here, their back would be here, and what you can see right here is the aorta in long axis. This is the celiac trunk. This is a superior mesenteric artery. We can see the spine right here. And this is the liver as well as the inferior margin of the liver here. Now the next plane is still a long axis plane. The probe indicator is pointing towards the patient's head. But because of the way that it's positioned, it's actually a coronal plane. And I don't think that this is necessarily a really important thing for you to understand. Uh, another way to describe this would be a lateral long axis view of the abdomen. You could also just say coronal plane. Whatever works for you. Hopefully you can at least wrap your mind around what we're doing here. I think the terminology in this case isn't terribly important. Now the whole point of me discussing these different planes is to drive home the point that it's always important to interrogate your targets, whatever that is, whatever you're scanning, in two planes. So you can see right here we have a view of two spherical shaped structures. And this is how they would look in real life if you could actually see those structures exposed within the soft tissues. It kind of looks like a short axis view of two vessels. And this is what you'll see on your ultrasound screen, you'll see two spherical structures present. But it's important to interrogate them then in long axis to make sure that they actually are what you believe. Again, we're thinking that these are two vessels. But as you turn long axis on them, now we've gone 90 degrees or a orthogonal view to the original view, and you can see that actually the top structure is actually a spherical structure rather than a tube.
So this could be something like a lymph node in the inguinal region rather than a vein that you're evaluating for DVT. So now we'll transition over to probe movements. Again, this is a fairly simple concept, but it's something that is important to drive home because when we're communicating and talking about acquiring ultrasound images, we may say rotate on this or slide the probe down or fan the probe. And if you don't understand that terminology, it's hard to, to communicate. Now, before we actually talk about the terminology, I want to point out a common beginner mistake when you're first learning how to ultrasound is you put the probe on the skin and you just kind of rapidly fan the probe around. And when you're doing these rapid chaotic movements, it's really hard to get oriented on your ultrasound machine screen. So go ahead and place the probe on there and make small, simple movements. Remember that ultrasound beam that is coming out is actually less than paper thin. So small, slow movements are key. I've heard it likened to shining a flashlight in the fog. If you are in the woods and you have a dense fog and you're shining that flashlight around, you don't chaotically whip that flashlight around. You very slowly pan that flashlight across the horizon to look for any obstacles in front of you that you might run into. Another thing that everybody does when they're first starting out is they hold the probe at the top of the probe where the wire connects to the ultrasound probe. And it's almost as if they're afraid to touch the patient or something like that. Well, what invariably will happen is the ultrasound probe will slide. Remember, there is ultrasound gel on the skin. It is very slippery. And while you're not actually looking at your hand and you're looking at the screen for the ultrasound machine, your ultrasound probe is going to be sliding across that patient's skin and you're not even going to know it. And you'll find that it's really hard to acquire the images that you want. I recommend that you hold the probe down at the base of the probe and allow your pinky or your ring finger to kind of rest on the patient's skin. And that way you'll have a tactile sense of when you start to slide. And it also anchors the probe as well. So this would be an example of sliding the ultrasound probe. You notice that in this case, this individual is holding the probe down at the base rather than at the top. And they're having slow, pers purposeful sliding motion. And you can see the nice high resolution image that comes with that linear high frequency probe. Now we're talking about fanning. It's also called rocking. And in this case, when compared to sliding, you saw that they were sliding the face of the probe up and down the arm. Here, the probe is held in one position on the skin, but they are basically shining that ultrasound beam through the soft tissues. And this is done by fanning or rocking the probe side to side. Now we'll talk about rotation. You can see here they have the ring finger resting on the patient's skin and anchors the probe as they rotate on one point. And you can see the corresponding image here. We'll see this one more time as they rotate on whatever target it is that they are actually scanning. This converts the image from a short axis image of the forearm to a long axis image of the forearm. This concludes the second installment of the ultrasound physics and fundamentals discussion. In the next installment, we're going to discuss Doppler ultrasound. As always, feel free to shoot any questions to my email listed on your screen.